Hello, my name is William Diaz Jr. and today I'm reviewing Free Economics, a rogue economist explores the hidden side of everything, written by Stephen D. Levitt and Stephen J. Dubner. So these are two authors with similar names, so I'm just going to be referring from now on as uh, the two Stevens. Well, so Free Economics, so it talks about economics and also about sociology, but it talks about the more twisted side of things, the more uh, unconventional things like this first chapter start comparing two groups that seem very different but are have things in common so there are six chapters in this book and this book was written in 2005 and it's a short read 200 pages with big words per page and there are some graphs and lists and things like that so yeah it's a very quick read so what do these ch six chapters come uh, cover? So they have some things in common. And they have a uh, general team that the uh, conventional wisdom is wrong. It's not usually or, or necessarily usually wrong, but sometimes at least it is. And there are some uncomfortable questions one can ask and some uncomfortable answers, but they both can be good. And there's also the lesson that sometimes the incentives you try to create, they're kind of productive. They're, or they have no effect. So, what the, the, the sixth chapter? So, chapter one. It's about school cheaters and sumo wrestlers. What do they have in common? They have incentives to cheat some often. So, uh, a teacher, when they introduced... Uh, here's an example of incentives. When they introduced bonuses for uh, teachers who had... Uh, performance improvements for school and when they had threatened to take away funding from certain schools which didn't, didn't have enough grade, this incentivized the teachers to cheat on the, uh, the test. So it's not students or only that cheat, it's also the teachers. And usually they did it by, they take the student's test, they change some of the answer uh, to make them right. If they're smart, they correct the easier questions uh, with, so the likelihood is more of the outcome is more logical and you can see that there was cheating by the way of um, you see the test score go up heavily one year and then they slump down again because test scores are supposed to be stable or uh, increase incrementally but if they go like this you know there's a problem and sumo wrestlers so uh, sumo is a very traditional Japanese sport or something like that. Most of them are not paid, but if you're uh, in, the in the elite part, then you're very well, pretty well paid. Upper middle class salary. So, they have this system that you have to, there are 15 rounds in a sumo match. You have to win at least 8. So they have this corruption thing where the sumo wrestler makes a deal with another one. If one has passed already 8, so... Uh, an eight or niner wins who's won eight or nine rounds so far they make a deal with a seven that he will lose the next round so uh, they do that and they do that in exchange for some money thing or things like you scratch my back i scratch yours eventually because uh, yeah and uh, Yes, uh, sometimes it's been uncomfortable for people. How can you cheat in a traditional sport? But you can see that the results change heavily when media focus on it. So when there's um, when it's the final round and one has a sumo wrestler has to win this one to pass while the other one doesn't, the odds, for some reason, for corruption reasons probably, are in favor of the ones who loses typically. But if you have put the media on it, then it's more 50-50 or favors the winner. Chapter 2. What do you, does the Ku Klux Klan and real estate agents have in common? Well, they are... Uh, they use uh, the fact that they have access to certain information to their advantage. So the Ku Klux Klan wasn't really... T was taken pretty seriously and had a lot of power even if murders were slowly decreasing over time always each decade i think oh and here's another interesting quote i like i i love this since i'm um i like guns whenever i find a passage 
where there's a quote about the origin, uh, some negative origins about gun control or something like that. I like to mention it. So uh, there's a quote in there that the, one of the goals of the KKK, according to President Grant, and this was in the 1860s or 70s, is to take away gun rights from uh, African Americans. So uh, sm uh, in interesting fact. But what do the KKK and the real estate agents have in uh, common? When you have a lot of information revealed about them, or when access to information is improved, they lose their power. So they thrive on having information that uh, people don't have. Same thing with experts, they turn information to their advantage. They tell half-truths often, not necessarily high, lies, half-truths. Chapter three, why do drug dealers live with their mothers? So I talk about drugs. Here they talk about mostly about uh, African-American drug dealers in uh, Chicago when uh, during the crack, in crack uh, rise, rise of crack since that became a popular drug since cocaine was, used, was the drug of the rich but it's expensive so they created crack because it's cheaper. But, yeah. but here they don't really talk about oh how is it to be a crack but no they talk about the business side of it, the economics of drugs so that's interesting. So more and more people got into the market of selling crack so prices were lowered slowly, but initially people saw, okay, so if you work really hard, by the way, your odds of, uh, interesting fact, your odds of getting killed as a drug dealer, as a crack dealer, were higher than on death row. Death row is barely, people who are death row, the probability that they're killed is low. People who are crack dealers, the probability, probability that they're killed are very high, one in four, so. Yeah, so. And there's this structure, so you have the, uh, the boss of the drug uh, cartel, then you've got three officers, then you've got the 50 soldiers, and then you've got the rest who pay uh, payment dues for extortion money, protection money, things like that. And uh, the boss is paid well, uh, very good. The, he gets a giant salary, and he kicks up some of it to the so-called board of directors. It's interesting, enterprises and criminal organizations have a lot of things in common. Um, the uh, top uh, drug dealer, P drug dealer who used uh, the, the fact that he went to university and his advantage came up high in the system. He became a member of the board of directors, but yeah. So the drug boss, he earns a lot of money. And then you've got history officer. They like earn a sizable income, a pretty decent one. While the rest, they barely earn anything. But the incentive is, you get to the top, you get super rich. It's the stereotype of capitalism. Everyone else, you're screwed. So that was the crack uh, hierarchy. And prices went down because people joined the game. So why do crack dealers live with their mothers? Because they're usually poor. They, maybe it's not a good, it's the best job opportunity maybe they have because it's poor black people who become crack dealers. But uh, it's, a, it's a bad wage. And plus there's a risk of getting killed. So, uh, by the way, they have to get paid. Whenever there's a drug war, the bosses have no choice but to, to pay their soldiers more since you're not gonna be ready to get killed in a drug war for a bad, for a low price. Yeah, by the way, you can also put a price on pretty much anything you think. They've done studies of what compensation you receive. You receive a certain number of weeks of compensation if you lose a hand or a arm and fix, or things like that. So that you can imagine how something you can value some things, and there's later talk about the value of fetuses and uh, and newborns. So that's chapter four. So the the correlation between crime and abortion. So you get to see these two contrasting things. Ceausescu in Romania, totalitarian dictator, one of the worst ones in the world historically. He made abortion illegal in the sixties. And when you have abortion legal, accordingly, the people who don't want children now have them. And unwanted children have a high risk of becoming criminals. Those criminals, or people who don't like the regime, they start to rebel. And apparently that's the reason that uh, Ceausescu got killed. It is interesting that he was the only one killed during the 
1989 fall of the communist regimes. Maybe it has to do with the abortion law, but it's, uh, I'm a bit skeptical of that. But then he dis like, uh, the authors discuss the Siemens. Why did crime decrease in the United States heavily in the 90s? Like my double digits decreases in a few years or per year or something like that. Well, it's not because of gun control. The only uh, effective gun control, according to them, is you put a penalty on carrying an illegal gun. That's that kind of works. That can decrease crime. But uh, there's all most criminals. Four fifth of criminals get guns illegally anyway. So and not from. Uh, Retailers, so it there was gun laws were used. It. He also says that um, the feeling that more guns, less crime. That's not necessarily true. Policing decreased crime a little bit in the United States, quite a bit, but it was not the main reason. And it was not Giuliani who was directly involved. He gets a lot of praise for sinking crime in New York, but it wasn't him. It was something in general. But the main reason, according to the theory of this book, it's abortion. Roe v. Wade happened in the 70s, which legalized abortion through all American states, and that made that the generation of unborn children, uh, unwanted children, was never born. So it takes a generation, the 90s, to see that all those young criminals that would exist don't exist. You have still got the uh, old people, but they're dying off, and there's no new, not, not many young people to replace him, them. So you've got crime decreasing in the 90s and that's because of abortion apparently fifth chapter is are people affected more by nature or nurture parents tend to think please have it to do with nurture but no according to his book well there are color correlations like if you have more books in your house the kid has better grades that's a correlation but that's because of people who are smart and wealthy has high iq and wealth is correlated Rich people, they tend to have better genes. So that makes sense that their kids succeed better in school. Now, it's not as important the genes after school, because adopted kids, they, can do pre they do, do, don't do as well in school as normal kids, but they show much more improvement in, uh, in catch up after school. But there's no correlation uh, shown really. There's no causation that you nurture your children correctly, spanking does not work or affect really anything, except that if parents are honest about it, that makes them probably more sm smarter, so their kids are better. But everything has to do with genes, pretty with perfect parenting. Well, does that mean, oh, you can't parent your kids however you want? No. It just means that responsible parents tend to be and who have high IQs tend to be highly educated and have kids later. So correlation, but not causation. So what is chapter six about that? The final chapter, penultimate one? Well, it's on naming kids. Does naming affect your uh, chances in life? Now, if you take two applications and one is more favored than the other, the white sounding name more likely to be chosen than the black sounding name. Well, that's because the white sounding one sounds like from a richer family, while the black sounding one sounds like a poorer family, so not as uh, cooperable. And also, then if you if there was really a racist job uh, applicator, uh, applicant decider, uh, if he takes the white sounding name, it uh, and it turns out to be a black guy. Well, he did wasted the black guy's time because he won't get hired anyway, so it doesn't change too much. But it, uh, there's a point that people who uh, names tend to be indicate be a good indicator of the, the intelligence of parents or how they are. So, if the kids have stupid names, stupid parents sometimes, or poor parents and things like that. So there's uh, there's it. Uh, they're not, it's not that the names are affecting the kids really negatively, it's just that the genes they have and the upbringing they're going to get from those type of parents, it's not gonna be good. So you name your uh, uh, child a bad thing, or you miss, they, you can also see what it's with poorer and people who are, they misname things. 
right? There are some names, and also there's a lesson of you've got uh, these rich families. They name their kids something with whites, and then the whites down down the road, the poorer whites, they start taking those names, and the rich parents don't want to use those names for kids anymore. There's a lesson that um, there's no difference in school results really between races. If you control for factors like upbringing, IQ and things like that, there is no discernible difference, so that can be good news. So, so yeah, that's uh, pretty, pretty much an overview of this book. So, how would I uh, rate uh, Freakonomics? I would say 8 out of 10. It's a good book. Cover some words subject and you can read this very easily in a few days. It's not a great or amazing book. I mean, the subjects on your cover are already maybe a bit benign, but it's a good book. It's fun, re fun to read. So you want to kill some time, have some fun and learn some things. Have your mind blown maybe by some having some conventional wisdom debunked. You can read Freakonomics. So yeah, 8 out of 10. So, this has been the Avid Reader's Review of Freakonomics, written by uh, the two Stevens. I hope you enjoyed this review and I will see you guys next time.